Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. Unfortunately, a monolithic architecture gets a bad rap. Most equate it to a big ball of mud that's hard to change. While this can be true, it doesn't need to be. Let me explain how you can develop a monolith that actually looks similar to microservices without the deployment complexity. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on Event Store DB, check out the link in the description. This is what I assume most people think of when they think of a monolith. They think of a turd pile, but really behind the scenes, why they think that is because if they dealt with a monolith, they've actually dealt with this, which is a big ball of mud. But a big ball of mud isn't necessarily a monolith. A monolith can turn into a big ball of mud. But what this is describing is you could think of any of these bubbles as a class, as a module, whatever the case may be, but it's showing coupling. It's showing all the different coupling between all the different classes, services, uh, modules, whatever the case may be. And this high degree of coupling is really what causes the issue. This is what makes a system difficult to change and easy to introduce bugs because you're changing kind of one class or one module and affecting another. So just like a monolith can turn into a big ball of mud, so can microservices. This is a post from many years ago, 2014 from Simon Brown kind of when microservices, I think, kind of started getting some hype, which is what a lot of people still see today is what he calls the distributed big ball of mud. And he states, if you can't build a monolith, what makes you think microservices are the answer? Which is really true. You can still develop a big ball of mud with microservices. It just turns into a distributed big ball of mud. So as you'll see through the rest of this, there's kind of a fundamental set of ideas that if you apply to microservices, you can also apply to a monolith. And the differences between microservices and monolith get slimmer than what you might think. So one of the fundamental ideas is defining boundaries. And that's one of the good things that I think microservices brought to the forefront or made people start realizing with microservices or any side services, including even within a monolith, is defining boundaries. And why do you want boundaries? Well, you wanna be able to define a particular unit, whether it's a service, whether it's a microservice, whether it's a portion, a module within a monolith that has a set of capabilities. And behind those sets of capabilities, those business capabilities are the data that it owns. And it becomes a little walled garden of it owns those capabilities, it owns that data. So you can do this within a monolith, you can do this within microservices. You wanna define boundaries. So one way to think about this is if you have an existing monolith that I'm representing as this piece of cake and you wanna decompose this into different boundaries, really what you wanna do is you wanna take a slice out. You wanna separate this cake into various slices and a slice represents a boundary. Again, the capabilities that are specific to a part of the system. So another way of looking at this is if you have that big ball of mud, that big turd pile, and I believe Greg Young said this, is that you wanna have smaller little balls of mud. I say little turd piles. And the idea here is the same thing as microservices, is that you can have a team dealing with a particular set of use cases of capabilities or more than one team, but you just wanna decompose these things into something manageable. The difference between microservices and a monolith, when it comes down to doing this and defining boundaries, becomes a deployment concern. I said this probably five years ago at a conference and I was looked at funny about saying how this it's really a deployment concern. Because if you have logical boundaries, logical boundaries, I'm not talking about physical boundaries, I'm talking about logical boundaries, you can do define logical boundaries within a monolith, just like you will with microservices. So from a repository code standpoint, what we're thinking of is this blue box represents a boundary. I have three things in it. It has contracts, implementation, and tests. Contracts represent things like interfaces, delegates, maybe DTOs that represent messages, which I'll get to in a minute. Implementation is what your actual boundary does. All the different use cases, the actual code for it, and tests are self-explanatory. So what that means is if we have multiple different boundaries, we have implementation, reference other contracts, meaning one boundary here may need an interface or a message from this particular boundary, but they don't actually reference each other. If we're gonna call stuff in process because we are in a monolith, basically again, if you have some implementation in this particular boundary that needs something from this particular boundary, it's gonna reference that interface or that message exactly like that. Now again, 
this is about logical separation. So each boundary has its own schema. That does not mean that this particular boundary talks to the schema of this particular boundary. It has its own schema. If it needs to get data, it's using the API via the contracts. But again, this is about logical. So another way of looking at this is if you had a single database instance, you can do that. It's just about having a separation of schema so that each boundary owns that particular schema. So to go even further with this is because we are talking about a monolith in its single deployment uh, unit of deployment is that all these different boundaries are composed together into the same process. So we're back to our monolith of how you think about it. We have a single process that's running. They're communicating um, in process to each other and talking to a database. That's how probably most people would think about a monolith. Yet the difference is there's clear boundaries within that unit of deployment. So we have our boundaries defined, they talk to their own schema, and they deal with the APIs to each other if they need to communicate. So I like to take this a step further and decouple by removing the synchronous in-process communication and moving that out a process to asynchronous messaging. So what that looks like is I have two top-level processes. I have ASP.NET Core, which is our web app, or HTTP API, and a message processor. But both of these top-level processes have in process all the different boundaries. They have all these assemblies. So again, we still have one unified code base, but we're deploying two processes. So what that looks like is if we have an HTTP request comes in, that gets routed to the right boundary in process still. And if we have some mutation, something that happened that we want to let another boundary know, instead of directly calling it in line, rather what we're going to do is we're going to send a publish an event or a message to our message broker. And from there, what's going to happen is our message processor via publish subscribe is going to consume that message and then publish it, route it basically to the boundary that actually cares about it. So we're removing that inline synchronous communication and moving things out of process. So we don't have our boundaries communicating anymore directly. They're using asynchronous communication for it. So if you're building a new system or trying to decompose an existing monolith, think about boundaries. You have this monolith that maybe is really coupled. Try to define what those boundaries are and what those capabilities are and then split them up so that you have those capabilities and that set of data that it owns behind it. Again, this is about logical deep coupling. Everything's set in the same process still, and even though they look like three different databases, they can still be in the same instance. Just separate the schema. And then from there, try to move some of that communication, that coupling, to get a little bit more loose coupling by using asynchronous messaging. So publish events and commands to a message broker. Use publish subscribe to communicate. Move some of that in-process communication from one boundary to another that was simply using an interface and try to push some of that communication that you can out of process and use asynchronous messaging. I like to call this a loosely coupled monolith where you have well-defined boundaries. Within those boundaries, you have data ownership, the schema that it owns. And each boundary primarily communicates via asynchronous messaging. So I mentioned earlier in this, the difference between a loosely coupled monolith, this approach, and microservices really becomes deployment. If you have services that are independently deployable, great if you have that need. You are able to change like one line within a microservice or a service and deploy that individual service. There's some complexities to this. With a monolith, however, you're deploying everything as a single unit. So, and then there's a trade-off there. So the answer or the question to you, should you use microservices or should, should you use a monolith, it comes down to a lot of factors in terms of the team, the organization, how you want to deploy. But I still go back to the fundamental idea here, whether you're using microservices or a monolith, is you need to define boundaries. So hopefully I illustrated that a monolith does not need to be a big ball of mud that's highly coupled and hard to change. You can define boundaries and be loosely coupled. And with a monolith, get the benefit of a simplified deployment. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.